Hi, everyone, and welcome. You have tuned in to JSA TV and JSA Podcasts, the newsroom for telecom and data center professionals. I'm Barb Mitchell. On behalf of my team here at JSA, welcome to the latest in our series of virtual roundtables. So our first 100 res registrants for today's roundtable will have received a fresh lunch delivered to your door. I know our panelists have been enjoying uh, their lunches as we've been uh, uh, preparing this morning uh, or this afternoon. Um, and, and some of you will have received a gift card to order your own meal. So while you are all beginning to enjoy your meals, let's get things underway. As a quick reminder for everyone who's joined us today, we look forward to your participation during the event. So please feel free to add any questions you may have right into the chat. And as usual, as we've been doing uh, on recent roundtables, uh, for the last 15 minutes of the hour, we'll move our conversation over to LinkedIn, where you can engage uh, with our participants directly. Simply type in hashtag JSA virtual roundtables, or click on the direct link that will be posted in the chat. Once we're over there, we'll answer any questions that may not have been answered by the panelists while on camera. And of course, if you have any questions about upcoming roundtables, whatever those may be, such as how to register or how to participate, feel free to reach out to us through our website at jsa.net. Our next virtual roundtable will cover the state of financial networks and will take place on October 15th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So without further ado, we've got the housekeeping notes out of the way. Let's get started. Our topic today, as you all know, is the ever-evolving face of tech and telecom. Uh, today, we're talking to some top female leaders uh, in, the, in the industry about what they're seeing changing or not changing, as the case may be, with respect to diversity and inclusion. We will look at the organizations that these executives are leading and talk about what areas they have seen evolving and why. Uh, we'll talk about what some organizations are doing especially well and what areas need to be focused on in order to develop the organizations that are built for the future. Lastly, we'll talk about what initiatives may have been slowed down in 2020. We all know it's been uh, quite a year, lots of, lots of things pulling people in many different directions, uh, but conversely, to what extent positive changes have accelerated during this tumultuous year. So here to discuss all of this today, it is my pleasure to introduce you to our exceptional executive lineup. Joining us today, we have Mary Morgan, Vice President of Marketing for Stream Data Centers, Rachel Cunningham, Senior Manager, Sales Engineering and Support for DQE, and Corey Cohen, VP of Marketing for Telecom Brokerage Inc. Thanks so much for joining us today. Really looking forward to this discussion. Uh, so just, could, just to start, would you mind each of you just introducing yourselves, telling us a little bit about yourself, uh, your company, your role, and and why this you know, topic is of interest. Uh, Mary, if you wouldn't mind kicking off. Yeah. Well, good morning from Texas. I think I'm the only one that can say that, but um, it's a great place to be uh, in the tech world and um, with the weather cooling off outside, it's um, pretty awesome. So I'm uh, Mary Morgan. I've been in technology marketing for 20 years. Um, my first brush with making money in technology was when I bought Apple at 54, and I quickly learned that um, it, it might be an interesting place to take my career. Uh, eight years with a semiconductor giant, the last six or seven in the data center business, having worked for a large REIT, and um, with now with Stream Data Centers, which is a great company uh, based here in Dallas, Texas. We have a national footprint of data center properties that we um, develop, <clears throat> operate, lease, and sell. We, um, we, we do like to sell things at Stream Data Centers and we're all about um, good business. And uh, the interesting thing about us is we're part of a larger commercial real estate firm known as Stream Realty Partners, which gives us a great um, opportunity for uh, a national footprint, um, technical real estate expertise, and um, just overall commercial real estate thought leadership and knowledge. So it's, it's a really great company and I'm proud to be here. Um, the thing about stream data centers that sets us apart is kind of our vision and mission of developing bespoke enterprise solutions for the Fortune 500, 
but our new product offering in the hyperscale space is awesome. We're excited about it. Uh, we've got some exciting things going on um, in major markets, and uh, the hyperscale products are really um, compelling opportunity for us. Uh, with that said, um, I manage marketing and communications, and this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart because I've had to figure it out. 20 years ago, there wasn't an internet of things, and we've seen a, you know, quite an evolution to where now that's a way of life and the cloud is um, where it's at, and we have, a, we have a really interesting story to tell. So I'm glad to be here, thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. Yeah. And Mary is a veteran, I think, to this sort of annual topic that we do with JSA. So welcome back. Uh, Rachel, would you mind uh, going next? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining today. Uh, my name is Rachel Cunningham. I work for DQE Communications. Uh, we're located in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We're a fiber network provider. Uh, we focus on the customer, honestly, uh, and providing them, you know, strategic solutions for their businesses, whether it be from dark fiber, internet, ethernet, and beyond. Uh, DQE has really, the past 20 plus years, uh, maintained our focus on, on the client and providing that service with integrity, uh, understanding that we have all different types of clients that we serve, um, and really providing that reliable service and um, providing excellent customer care to those clients that they've come to expect. Uh, my role at DQE is a senior manager of sales support and engineering. So my team and I have a direct responsibility for pre-sales customer design of our actual network, uh, the LIT network, um, order implementation success for our clients. So order tracking, making sure that they're informed of all the different steps in the order process um, and post-sales customer experience. So that last bucket kind of involves a lot of different things, but um, you know, kind of tying back to what DQ is about, which is providing that reliable and responsive service um, here in the in Pittsburgh market and beyond. So thank you for having me today. Thank you, Rachel. And Corey? Yes, hi there. My name is Corey Cohen. I'm Vice President of Marketing at TBI. So thanks once again for tuning in. Um, TBI is the largest privately held master agent. We are a third party technology services distributor and we work with um, selling partners. Uh, we, we, well, first of all, I should say we are over 230 people strong and we work with selling partners across the country and internationally, helping them grow and build their business through mobility sales, security sales, um, all cloud communication and collaboration um, along with network and connectivity. And I'm delighted to be here today and uh, talk about this important topic and what TBI is doing to, well, what TBI is doing for our part in um, promoting diversity and inclusion, but also helping to uh, establish an equal environment for all to thrive. Thank you, Corey. And it's such an important topic. It's one that has, um, it garnered increased attention and focus, you know, well before this year. Uh, you know, I, I think uh, organizations, for the most part, to, to some extent at least, recognize that there's a need uh, to look into this, right? At, at, so at the minimum. Um, so before 2020 hit us, it was already important, um, diversity and, and inclusion. Uh, there we started to see programs uh, coming up. But can you talk about why you think this is important in particular, why organizations are seeing this, and to what extent this year, uh, 2020, has escalated the response, whether it be in your organization or others? Mary, would you uh, kick that off? Well, I mean, you know, especially this year, business can't hide from the need to be more inclusive, um, to put it top of mind, uh, to embrace an evolving culture. Um, I think there's also a competitive aspect to acknowledging um, diverse contributors because you know we're all looking to take it to the next level and by um, embracing change, embracing uh, new horizons and opportunities. I just think it's good business. Also, can I, I represent the creative um, side of things in the technology world, and 
more and more technology entities are looking for creativity, uh, they need to be scrappy, and they're just gonna have to learn to do things differently. And um, that's why it just makes good sense. But, you know, just, just like in generations past where, uh, you know, women won the right to vote or um, racial issues became uh, more complex and then uh, more open and um, inclusive. We're just taking it to the next level. And I think technology businesses are learning to recognize what we have to offer. So there is a social implication. There is the cultural implication, but I think more and more people just see this as good business. Um, our organization is responding directly. Uh, in 1999, Stream Data Centers was acknowledged by Capacity, Capacity Media for being the leading data center provider in gender diversity. And we were real proud of that. We, during a period of hyper growth, we were able to hire a large percentage of women um, to take on very significant jobs. We're very customer focused and um, we are very, very much creating uh, a white glove customer centric experience for uh, our data center customers and, and bringing women in to not only execute on that vision and that our products, but bringing women in to help manage the company is very important. And at a larger level, Stream Realty Partners has been very proactive. We've acknowledged three new diverse groups in our, at the management level. Um, we include uh, contributors from all over the company at all levels of uh, management and, and uh, to address things like environmental and governments, governance issues, uh, women's issues, and uh, racial um, balance. So we, I, I like that the fact that our organization, close to a thousand people nationwide, is able to take this on in a unified manner to um, talk about how it's good for everyone. And I think the other thing that leadership here at Stream has done so well is acknowledge that we can all do better. We can all do better. Um, we can all empower each other to move the, ne the needle, be successful and, and win as a team. So um, at the risk of singing Kumbaya with my fellow streamers right now, I will uh, hand it off to Corey as uh, hers, but uh, I, I just think it's good business sense. It's, culture, it's a cultural imperative and there's so many reasons to do this better. Um, mm -hmm. Women almost feel like we have, we have to have specific um, objectives in mind to, but we'll talk about that later. And yeah. Um, yeah, you're, I know you're right, Mary. There's so many proof points to show why it's important. Um, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because it's better for business. You know, I was talking with, with Rachel uh, about this beforehand, because I'm going to specify and say, like, I was a little nervous to do this, this panel because I'm not talking about technology, which I normally am. I'm talking about diversity and inclusion, which I am not an authority on. However, then I started thinking like, well, this is a human issue, right? And this is actually the forefront of the conversation. Right now, this isn't, like you said, Barb, a new conversation. This has been going on for years, highlighted, you know, Rodney King in the early 90s. I mean, this, this isn't a new conversation, but we happen to be in the age of a pandemic where we're forced to take a step back and kind of take inventory of our lives and of our workplaces. And so then I thought to myself, like, why do I have to be nervous? Like I am an executive. I, you know, am in charge of hiring. I'm not the HR manager, but like, I certainly have a say. And, and frankly, you know, I can only speak to my, you know, experience as a white woman, which we all are on this panel, um, not very diverse in and of itself. But I will say I wrote down some stats because I think it's important to highlight, right? I mean, we're talking not just about gender, but also diversity. And 
from a gender perspective, right, um, you know, women make up 47% of the labor force, so it's almost half, but only a third were managers in 2019, and they were mostly white women. In fact, women of color had drastically less showing, like Latinas, 4.3%, Black women, 4, 4%, Asian American women, 2.5%. I mean, we can do better just from a holistic standpoint. So, um, and then I'm going to pass it off to Rachel, but I do want to say that, you know, TBI is doing its part. We're a very diverse organization across the board from all levels, um, entry level all the way through management. Um, and people value work culture. Employees, it's been studied that employees value fairness across the board, not just for themselves, but for the entire organization. They like rate that as one of the reasons why they go to work at a company. So from a TBI perspective, what we're doing, um, we have LGBTQIA sponsorship, promotion, awareness. We encourage our employees to share with us organizations they're involved with for us to support. We have weekly all company meetings where we interview people in the organization that we might not know. And they come on and they tell their background and their story. We have executive, I'm gonna call them like memos, but they're basically just restating our core beliefs as a company and why, why we do the things we do. Um, and we started a diversity and inclusion committee. And I think um, we've really worked the past few years to make it, um, I mean, it's always, been, it's always been a diverse environment, but we focused very much on having everyone feel comfortable to share. And so I think that is one of the reasons why we were voted best places to work in the Cranes and Chicago Tribune. And that's why I'm a proud, proud TBI family member. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. It's so great to hear the examples of how your organizations are, are you know, contributing to this effort. Yeah. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, sure. So um, it's funny that Mary and Corey mentioned a couple of things that um, I think kind of tie back to what I wanted to say. Um, you know, as, as Barbie mentioned, um, this is not, you know, obviously it's come to the front uh, in 2020, but um, this has been a topic that's been of importance to my organization for, for um, happily a couple years now, um, at least. So two years ago, our organization created a, a D&I Council, Diversity and Inclusion Council as well. Uh, I was glad to be one of the 18 um, employees on that council that ranged from, you know, new employees to tenured employees. Um, you know, folks in all different departments, um, all different kind of, you know, tenures in their careers as well. Um, you know, we really focused in on, you know, to, to Corey's point, Mary's point, um, culture, talent engagement, and community involvement. Um, what I thought was, uh, what I wanted to bring up here is something that Mary said regarding company culture and how do we, you know, it's, it's a good business decision to tie together what is, what about the company culture we can tie to these types of things. So, uh, DQE has a uh, very strong passion for volunteerism in the community. We always have big kind of contributors to United Way and some other things. What I thought was interesting, what the DNI Council did was tie that element to our DNI Council. So we were involving in um, doing volunteer based events for minority owned businesses, doing volunteer based events uh, for LGBTQIA um, groups in the community as well, participating in the Pride Parade. Um, as, as a volunteer effort and things like that. So, um, you know, just, just in the past year, uh, we volunteered over 3,500 hours of our employees in the region and really focusing in in the past year or two on equity in our communities and some of those, um, some of those groups. So, um, you know, as far as, you know, since March and kind of having to change it up, obviously we've had to think about ways that we can still continue that type of behavior. Um, but, you know, not necessarily being able to do it in person anymore, right? Not being able to go out and do, you know, do things at food banks in person and things like that, um, especially when all this first started. Uh, so a couple ways that, that DQE has really, um, has really pivoted there has been um, participation in a, a blog celebrating women in tech as a part of International Women's Day. And I'm happy to send that out um, after this. It, it really shined a light on some of our leaders at, at DQE and what we're specifically doing. Um, also, you know, participation in these types of panels for our leadership team and being, being open um, to participating in those things because, you know, 
they're now virtual. So I uh, just wanted to highlight those things. I just think it was interesting kind of tying back the company culture to, you know, what, what means to the company and, and DNI. So. Yeah. I love that all your organizations have initiatives in place already and, and a focus against this. And I think the conversation then becomes, uh, is it enough? You know, is it enough? Are you doing, I mean, your organizations are, are doing a lot. Are other organizations doing enough? Is there more that needs to be done in the industry as a whole? Uh, so I was just going to talk for a second about, so last year, uh, Melinda Gates announced that she would be contributing a billion dollars towards creating opportunities for women in the tech sector through her organization, Pivotal Ventures in cooperation with the Reboot Recognition Tech Coalition, which is, you know, some of the top uh, organizations within the tech industry. Gates and fellow leaders and influencers have been working to shed light on the need to close the gender and diversity gap in our industry. In addition to surveying companies about their existing strategies, researchers spoke with more than 100 leaders in the field to determine what strategies were proving effective. So people, you know, just like you, right, talking about what are you doing that's working, um, but also, you know, what, what are some ways that you think that we can make a difference? The resulting research, which was called the Reboot Representation, I highly recommend it. It's quite a long read, but it's full of information, recommendations, um, case studies, et cetera. It provides advice on how to pick and set a strategy that's in line with a company's business objectives uh, and, a, and also a self-assessment to figure out if, if what you're already doing is working. Uh, so I just wanted to start and just, the panelists will respond to this. Um, a lot of the, the folks from the coalition have provided quotes. I'm gonna start with a quote from Melinda Gates, who's of course, you know, the inspiration for it all. Um, so I'll read the quote and then I'll let the panelists respond. As the tech industry continues to expand beyond Silicon Valley to other areas across the country, we have the opportunity to reimagine what the sector could look like. If these emerging tech hubs are supported to prioritize women's representation and inclusion as they grow, they will be better positioned to tap into the full range of local talent, while also helping create a blueprint for closing the industry's gender gap nationwide. So, um, Corey, do you want to take that? Do you want to talk about um, just obviously in this quote, there's an uh, emphasis on the importance of closing the gender gap across the tech industry. And we'll talk later about, you know, beyond the gender gap and further, you know, thoughts on diversity. But do you agree with the importance of this and why? 100%. I'm like so passionate <laughs> about this. Um, and there, uh, there is a, obviously a, 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 a gaping uh, discrepancy in, um, you know, female leadership and male leadership, but I'm not 100% certain. I mean, it's not a, it's not a tech sector issue. It's a, it's a global work issue, actually. Um, I'm all about the stats. I brought them today because I, when I was like doing research for this panel, I, I was so, um, I already knew some of these, but as I delved, as I dove deeper into, into research, obviously it's a rabbit hole. Um, but it was, fascinating to highlight some of this key, you know, um, the, the key gap, right? Um, and if you think about this, uh, generally speaking, um, in 2019, the proportion of women in senior management roles rose to 29%. It didn't increase 29%. It's at 29% of all female leaders in senior management roles. And that is, um, predominantly human resources, and within um, medical and health services and food services. So um, in 2020, 40% of those human resource directors were women compared to the chief marketing officers, which was only represented at 17%, and CIOs, which was 16%. Um, I mean, if you think about that, uh, A, there's a problem with women advancement. I'm not sure how much, and it will be interesting to see the repercussions of this pandemic to see, because I know many women, right, that are, are, are working mothers, but then decided to stop working because during COVID, they didn't feel comfortable having childcare. So they assumed the role of childcare and left their job. Um, I, now there is an extreme division of labor amongst uh, roles of, of spouses. 
um, where there might not have been before. So it'll, it'll be interesting to see how the, um, I guess, economics play out uh, in terms of leadership roles with, with women. But um, I do want to say that McKinsey did a report, uh, Women in the Workplace, in partnership with LeanIn.org. And it says that women are falling uh, behind in their careers because um, if first level women were promoted like men, there would be 1 million more women in management over the next five years. So there's work to do. Promotion. Yeah. Giving, giving more people a shot. Also, I do want to specify that in the previous answer, I did also write down another stat, which was um, diverse, uh, diverse teams are 35% more productive. Yep. Absolutely. I, I think that um, one stat that I will, it's not really a stat, it's more of a, uh, I don't know, an observation, <laughs> but, but um, and we talked about this earlier, there are more men named James leading Fortune 500 com companies than there are women, which is, and I know that you had said that you heard a, a similar but slightly revised version of that. So, I mean, yeah, lots of- Isn't that crazy? It is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mary, did you want to add? Sure. Um, I applaud Melinda Gates. I hope she takes some of that billion dollars and puts it toward education to the up-and-comers. Um, I'm, I come at this, I'm so appreciative of Corey for having the stats and for you guys bringing, you know, some of this intel to bear because we know it's all out there, but I come at this from a kind of a generational perspective, um, organically, uh, I think women have to show up. We have to teach our daughters what STEM means because acronyms really don't resonate. We, it means you can make money by using your skill sets to work in the technology sector, right? So um, I think whether it's Melinda Gates or us or any of our colleagues, we have to speak in, in terms that are consumable and digestible to the youth to our peers and to the market at large. And I think um, now it's imperative and as we grow, it's imperative that leadership at the highest level embrace the opportunity to take on new talent, but at, at every level, women and diverse groups have to show up. You know, we have to show up, we have to have the expertise, we have to have the know-how. And sometimes when you're just trying to get through school and find a job that, you know, some of that doesn't compute. I think the gender bias is, is kind of a natural um, flow that if you look at the engineering schools and the, and the other kind of math and science educations and backgrounds that feed our industry, it's kind of natural that the, that the men floated to the position they're in now. Um, along with, with every other group. But now if, if we teach the community, our peers and our daughters and our friends to show up and bring their skill sets. I mean, I'm in marketing, I'm creative, but every technology leader I've worked has, with has appreciated the skill sets I can bring to complement theirs so that we can go to market effectively. And that's what I've loved about it. I've loved being part of the team and I've loved the win, and I've, I love how things, I love learning how things work. So if you appreciate learning and understanding how things work, you can appreciate technology, and then the youth of our, our world can learn to embrace that on a more tangible level. And so this is, my dialogue is all about making it more tangible, making it more actionable, giving people an opportunity that they can embrace and understand instead of just talking about it. So um, I love this, and I think all these perspectives have to come together to, to dovetail into the solution. You know, yeah. Mary, I don't mean to cut you off, and obviously I, I, I'm like interjecting, um, but you said something about, you said something about women showing up. Mm -hmm. And I wholeheartedly agree, but it's been known and studied that women have to almost like work tw 
twice as hard to be noticed above like a male counterpart. And I think that's where it's not, that's what, I'm not necessarily sure my point, but I might, but what I think I'm trying to say is that it is harder and increasingly harder to live your life, a work-life balance, working yeah. twice as hard and having a life separate from work, trying to advance a career, also struggling in a pandemic. It seems like the world is on our shoulders yeah. and it's harder to show up. <laughs> You're right about all that, but at the same time, as women, we have innate skill sets and talents that guys just don't have. I mean, we think in a wide, wide, wide radius. We think in terms of throwing a net. You know, hunter gatherers, you know, the guys are notorious for being very focused, very linear. And I don't mean to like cast um, blanket aspersions on. Or the opposite sex or anything like that but like we think big women think big and and I've I've worked with babies under my desk I've worked at home I've worked at night 24 7 to get this done because I, I did have to try harder right and you know I often felt like I was winning because I I had to I had to work at it and learn more and show up harder like you're saying to get there but then once i got there the teamwork was great you know the the it's the, being on a dream team you know the all the things they say about teamwork makes it work and all that it it, it, it can happen we but it, it and it's harder for us to show up and if guys and the world and the leadership can appreciate that of us we'll continue to show up even better we can polish our our style we can write our stories the way we want them to be told and um as women i think we we do have the power to show up like we need to and and i think the, the needle is moving on opportunity and it's, it's it's very exciting but you're right corey it's true yeah rachel did you want to add to that um, I just wanted to add kind of something I think is just another layer of this conversation that I think should be pointed out. So, you know, part of the Melinda Gates quote that is very important is about, you know, hiring talent, right? Hiring the recruitment process. But I think that it's important for all of us to recognize that recruitment is just the first step of this, right? So retention of those employees, making them feel welcomed, included, and empowered throughout their employee life cycle is just as crucial. Um, some ways that, you know, my organization is supporting that is we actually just launched our first business employee resource group, Berg, as it's eloquently named, and um, if specifically focusing on women and energy in our organization, um, serving as a forum for awareness, education, and supporting those employee connections. So um, this is for all, for employees of, you know, brand new in the life cycle to tenured women in the company. So. I think it's just one one example, but I do think you know the the hiring process, recruitment, bringing in that talent, the the STEM programs for education are obviously very important. Um, but I think you know the the next the next thing or an equally important thing is is retaining those talented employees and making them feel included and empowered throughout their time with our organizations. That's. Such a good point. And actually, interestingly, um, it's been, you know, leaders of the industry are actually forecasting a shortage in uh, workers in this sector. So demand for workers with advanced IT and tech skills will grow as much as 90% over the next 15 years. And they're already projecting a shortfall of those workers over the next three years. Uh, so it's really important that the sector stays on top of this and is expanding its talent pool. And, and so where do you go for your talent pool? You go potentially to a previously underutilized talent pool, which includes women and, and women of color. Uh, today, and Corey said stats, stats very similar to this, but women today, and particularly women of color, are chronically underrepresented at every stage of the tech journey. So only, uh, you were talking, Corey, about the entire you know, workforce, but only 11%, so quite a bit lower than the workforce. I think what it, you said 20, I can't remember what your number was, in the 20s of uh, women in leadership roles, but only 11% 
of tech leadership roles are held by women. So skews much lower. It's already low for the workforce in general, skews much lower uh, for tech. And so, you know, one of the things that when I start talking, I started talking about the, the reboot coalition, right? One of the things that they were looking at is the, the different um, points of entry for uh, women. And so it's things from school, Mary, you mentioned school age programs, um, but beyond that, so early STEM education early on, but then throughout, you know, you know, beyond into university and then, um, you know, opportunities once you've begun your career. Uh, so last year, uh, one point I just wanted to make was that, so these, the top 32 tech companies spent over $500 million on philanthropic, philanthropic giving, but only 5% of that went to programs aimed at correcting tech's gender imbalance. And most, so most of those went into school age programs actually. Um, and less than 0.1% of that actually went to uh, support women of color. Uh, so over and over the past decade, the ratio of Black, Latina, and Native American women uh, receiving degrees in the tech space has dropped a third. It was never high. It was 6%. It dropped to 4%. So it's actually getting lower in, instead of uh, better. So just, you know, I like my quotes, so I'll throw another couple quotes at you guys, and that'll, that'll lead us into the next question. But, you know, the, the idea of these quotes is you know, the extent to which having a more diverse workforce actually benefits the bottom line of the organization and helps a better input for your organization, for innovation, and for society in general. So two, two quotes. The first is, innovation is born from a diversity of ideas, perspectives, and experiences. So Greg Clark, former CEO of Norton LifeLock, said that. Sarah Link, Director of Societal Impact for Verizon, said, Diversity in all its forms is critical to the future of technology and innovation. The fresh ideas and perspectives we need to address the world's biggest challenges come only when the technology industry reflects the society that it serves. Reflects the society that it serves. I think that's a great quote. So I just want to throw it back to you guys. In what ways are you seeing diversity and inclusion evolving across the industry? And in what ways is it supporting organizations? Rachel, do you want to? Uh, sure. Uh, so when you mentioned, um, you know, serving the communities or serving the, the footprint, uh, a big shift I'm personally seeing, uh, my team has responsibility for re responding to RFPs or requests for proposals. So uh, DQE's largest subcontractor happens to be a women-owned business. So we've been able to offer this up as, you know, kind of supplemental information in our bids for, for many, many years. Um, however, I would say probably the past like 18 to 24 months, I've seen a shift, especially from certain verticals, honestly, that um, supplier diversity has moved from being, you know, maybe a feature of a bid to being a requirement, to being a metric in the ultimate decision-making of a bid. So I, I think that, you know, our pro prospects, our clients, vendors, um, organizations as a whole are pushing for supplier diversity. And I only anticipate, honestly, I only think that's gonna continue, so. Yeah. I'm, uh, I, I mean, I, I, I agree with you in that, um, yes, I'm sure there's tons of RFPs coming down the pike saying, you know, they want minority and, and women-owned business, um, whether they hire them or not, right? You know, it might just be like a, a check mark on the RFP. Um, to answer your question, in what ways am I seeing diversity and inclusion evolve across the industry, I'm not... 100% sure I am. <laughs> um, we're, we're focused on this topic for a reason today. I made, the, I made the statement in that stat that says racially diverse and gender diverse uh, groups are 35% more productive than non-diverse groups. And um, I was reading that one of the biggest hindrances or one of the biggest reasons why managers don't hire more diverse employees is because they're afraid of, of introducing conflict, <laughs> which is just simply like not true. Um, I, don't, I don't know how we can expect to see change with, you know, a completely male dominated executive team that is consistent across 
the majority of organizations globally um, and just ex expect them to like change the chemical makeup of their organization simply because this is a topic of discussion. I think it's led by employees. Um, I think that people accept jobs based on companies that share similar beliefs. I mean, there's so many stats about, not stats, there's so many, like, there's so much research about millennials and the workforce and, and Gen Z coming on board and only going to companies that have a certain sustainability program or a certain philanthropic program that have core beliefs that, that are inherent in their nature. And because of that, that will force change. You know, the younger generation is our future. Um, and so I, I, I don't know if I've seen change, but I'm hopeful, um, you know, to give another stat, I will say like, and this was shocking to me, Google and Microsoft's um, black and Latino staff has only gone up 1% since 2014. Um, you know, we're expecting now, Conversely, I will say that you're seeing a lot of Fortune 500 and 100 companies like Salesforce and, and some other large companies that have a real big um, presence uh, in terms of promoting gender and, and racial diversity. So you're seeing a lot of large companies help lead the change, but I'm not sure... I'm not, I'm not sure if we're going to be seeing these large organizations help lead the change or if it's going to be some of these mid-market companies that are going to be the first to, to make the shift. Yeah, interesting. What do you think, Mary? I agree 100%. Um, we, we are seeing some female decision makers come across from the large companies, but um, I think the biggest thing that I'm seeing is the conversation. The conversations are happening. Um, the awareness is happening and that's the biggest thing I see. But again, um, I'm like, Corey, I'm not sure I see it. I'm not sure I see the needle moving, but I see the conversations happening, which I think again, will lead to a trickle down effect for Gen Z and the youth that are coming up behind us. I mean, so many things are changing, but um, specifically to your question, uh, the way STREAM gives back to empower future generations is by funding educational scholarships through iMasons. Infrastructure Masons is um, a notable organization in our industry that is, has, through leadership of various IT infrastructure organizations and cloud companies are taking on the mission of um, shepherding uh, education opportunities to fund our future. And so working with them, they do have a women's organization within Infrastructure Masons. There is the Women in Technology, um, Women Technology Forum. And I'm seeing those conversations become more frequent and more empowering because like this round table, we're bringing uh, thought leaders to bear on, th on topics that will benefit not only our careers, but the industry at large. And so I think just by sharing um, the conversations and drumming up more awareness, we will move the needle eventually, but I don't think it'll happen fast. Um, mm -hmm. Conversations are happening and I think people are aware and that's that's the biggest thing I see. Yeah. Well, this, this is such an important conversation and there's so much more for us to talk about. Um, we're out of time unless anyone has any burning thoughts that you want to share, any of the panelists. Um, but you know, thank you. Thank you to the panelists uh, for participating today. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Just a quick reminder that our speakers are staying on for the remainder of this hour to answer any of your questions uh, via LinkedIn. So you can go to LinkedIn, search for hashtag JSA virtual roundtables or click, there's actually a direct link in the chat box uh, here. Uh, so you can go there to continue the Q&A. And of course, viewers, if you were one of our lucky first 100 registrants, we hope you enjoyed your lunch. 
uh, go ahead and visit us at jsa.net to register for our next JSA virtual roundtable. Uh, the next one will be taking place on October 15th, where leaders in our industry will talk about the state of financial networks. Uh, so that's a wrap. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and go ahead and look for the playback of today's roundtable coming soon to JSA TV and JSA podcasts on YouTube, iTunes, iHeart, Spotify, and more. In the meantime, see you on LinkedIn. Happy networking. Bye. Have a good day.